Okay, here we go. We're back at the beginning. Um, we're talking about navigation and national airspace system. Uh, remember our objectives. Uh, risk management, okay. So um, tonight we're gonna be talking about the, the environment that we're in, looking at the national airspace and, um, and the space that we'll be considering that, that we'll be going through for our, uh, setting up different cross country flights. Um, here's our task of the first one. We've got two tasks tonight. So this one we'll be looking at national airspace. What are the VFR weather minimums to get through it? And what are their dimensions look like? What are pilot certifications and glider equipment uh, requirements to go through these different spaces? Okay, so VFR sectional charts. Um, got another question here. Yes, thank you. Okay, VFR sectional charts. Um, there's different charts. There's terminal charts, which are which are even closer in detail. So you'd have those of like Portland or or more so Seattle. Um, this is these charts are one to five hundred thousand in scale. Um, you can see them for free on skyvector.com um, or ForeFlight, which requires a subscription, or Garmin requires a subscription. Um, you can buy them from uh, the FAA or our local FBO um, or Cumulus Soaring. Um, and on every chart, so if you look over here to the left, the Seattle sectional, that's what we're the section that we're in. Right, so we're here, over here is Hood River, the little red dot, and every chart will have a legend, and also on the chart, um, there will be legends over in water areas and things like that, talking about what all these different markings are. So the, the chart, it would be a good idea to download the free charts user's guide. Um, but also everyone should get a sectional for this this summer um, and and start poking around the uh, looking and seeing what different things mean. I'll give you an introduction as much as I can tonight. All right, so now here's chart supplement. So every airport has an, a chart supplement and it used to be called the AFD for airport and field directory and a lot of places still call it that even in um for flight they still call it the AFD but now it's called the chart supplement you can pull this up on sky vector and I'll show you that in a second for flight garmin um the chart supplements you can uh, see for free on the FAA website um you can buy these from uh, again, from the FAA, your local FBO, Cumulus Soaring. Here's ours, Hood River, Ken Jernstead Airfield, and it's and there's legends in the front of these books or online that show you how to read all these. So for this one, for Sierra 2, you know, is our field marker. It's, we're two miles south of the city. Um, we're eight uh, hours, you know, uh, ahead of Greenwich time. Here's our little... Longitude and latitude, we're 638 feet above the ground. Uh, traffic pattern altitude, um, so 869 feet above the ground. Runway information, airport remarks, manager phone numbers, and all that great stuff. So if this was Portland, this would be a couple pages long, much longer. Um, and just so out of completeness here, if I jump out of the program and we go to um, say sky vector and then he, here I'm pointing at the DAOs and when you click on it you highlight it and here the chart supplement is over here on the left oops nope over here on the left so there's chart supplement other things vfr chart ifr charts you can scroll down on this page and see lots of information but if i click here on the dows now you can read all that same information about the dows chart okay so there's a way to see it for free 
All right, so obviously on the FAA written test, they're going to start asking you questions. Here's ones determine the approximate latitude and longitude of Shoshine County Airport. And so you'll come down here to Shoshine, right? And if we start with our line of lat latitude coming up here, so latitudes, as you know, are lined out every 30 minutes this way and this way is each block is 30 minutes or one and so here's 47 and 30 we go up one two three ticks so here's 47 and 33rd and then we're on the 116 longitudinal line we're going to come up so 10 20 30 right so here's 11 so this is going to be 116 and 11 to the west. So our answer is going to be B, 47, 33, 116, and 11. And there will be lots of different things they ask about the chart, but you're going to be able to know all that by the time you take your exam. All right, and so then here I put in an example of what they're going to ask from, say, the chart supplement. Where is Loop City Municipal located with relation to the city? And on this one, remember that right off the bat, it, four Northwest shows you where the airport's in relationship to the city. So what do we got over here? That's interesting, four Northwest. None of these look like the right answer to me. Northwest approximately one mile, although I thought that said four miles, but okay, best guess or best answer. All right, so let's start with where we're at in Hood River. Our airport sits in Class G, and so you have Class G is our only uncontrolled airspace, and then all the other airspaces are controlled. Um, now, let's start taking a look at all these. Okay, so what does Class G airspace look like? Class G airspace, here's kind of the general rule. It's all airspace below 1,200 feet unless otherwise marked. Okay, you can think of Class G airspace, all airspace less than 1,200 feet unless otherwise marked, okay? Airports in Class G airspace that, uh, or uncontrolled airport, airports are magenta, okay? They're magenta on the airport. And, okay, so pilot certifications. Student certificate or better, okay? So you guys are all be fine. Uh, entry requirements, there's none. If an airplane's coming into uh, Hood River, they are, best practice is to self-announce 10 miles from the airport that they're coming in, and then once they get to the pattern. So we, we're out there pushing gliders and we may hear, 378 Sierra Romeo, 10 miles to the northwest over the Columbia, inbound for Hood River. And then we'll forget about them for about seven or eight minutes until we hear them again in the pattern reporting, okay? But um, glider requirement doesn't require a radio and there's no transponder required, okay? So kind of what you basically need to really think about is what do these airspaces look up like for weather? What kind of pilot certificate is needed? What type of glider, what equipment in the glider? Does it gotta be a radio or, or a transponder? And then what are the VFR weather minimums? Okay, so below, and class G is actually kind of the most complicated. They all get, class G and class E are kind of the most complicated as far as weather requirements. Below 1200 feet, which most of class G is, Clear of clouds, visibility one statue mile, okay? Now at night, 
it changes. It changes to 1,000 feet above, 500 feet below, 2,000 feet horizontal, three statute miles. Not likely that you'll be asked that by the examiner because you won't be flying at night. It could be on the written, but um, so that's just something you'll have to know for the written. But uh, and if you go on to be a power pilot, then you'll then you'll know that. Okay, so now the next part of that is above 1,200 feet. There are there used to be huge pockets in the U.S., and I think I mentioned that to you all, that there used to be huge pockets in the United States, even out here in Oregon, that their class G space would go up to 14,500 feet mean sea level. And a lot of that has disappeared. But out of sake to be complete, there, if you're above 1,200 feet, we use what we, what I call the 152 rule, 1,000 feet above, 500 feet below, 2,000 feet horizontal. There's a, there's a very popular Cessna trainer called the 152, so it's easy to remember, 152 rule, right? And visibility is one statute mile above 1,200 feet. Night, that would change to three statute miles, right? Now, if you go above 10,000 feet, I call it the one prime rule, meaning a thousand feet above, a thousand feet below, and one statute mile horizontal, and five statute mile visibility. So why do all these rules change, right? Well, it's because we have we have different traffic in different areas, right? And once you get up, you know, above ten thousand feet, you have jet liners and private jets um, and prop planes that are flying a lot faster on IFR flight plans. And if they come busting out of a cloud, it's all a chance that uh, you guys have a chance to see each other and try to try to move and correct. So it's all safety reasons for different traffic. Okay, so that's class G. That's where we start out, right? And what, so what's Class G look like? There's actually no markings for Class G on a map, right? Looking down at this map, if we're, if I'm sitting at 11, 1,199 feet in the air, then I'm looking right down at Class G. Now, all these magenta airports, all these, which are all these little markings here, right? Cascade locks. Hood River in the middle, the Dow's over on the right. They they show you that they're a non-towered airport, a non-controlled airport. Okay. Now, just a little bit of chartology right off the bat. See these little plus signs sticking out of the out of Ken Jurdstead or Hood River Airport. That means that airport has fuel. So right away you can look at an airport and say that has fuel. This Hanel private one, no fuel. Cascade locks, no fuel. The Dow's, it has fuel. That's great, right? And um, see the little star out of the top? That means it's got lighting, okay? It's got lighting. Cascade locks, no light, all right? So now let's just look at what's in a name here, okay? I'm get my little spotlight again here, I like this. Okay, so gives the name, Jernstead, Four Sierra two. AWOS three shows that we've got a, our weather station. Remember we talked about that. And here's the frequency for that weather station: one thirty four three seven five. Always, if this first mark on a field, an airport name is the field elevation, six hundred and thirty eight feet. This has an L for lighting, and the little asterisk means it's you can change the intensity of the, from the pilot. The three zero there means the length of the field and you would always add 200 feet. So that's, th we got a 3000 foot long field. And then this frequency here with the C is your common track for traffic frequency. So 122.8. Now this RP here would mean, would normally mean you would do right hand patterns. But with this star next to it, that means special conditions exist. And so, 
traffic at airport is by by the by the far aim is left hand turns but the rp you would call and you'd listen to the recording or you'd look up into the into the uh, chart supplement and you would see that it means right hand pattern for gliders glider operations and left hand patterns for power planes so anybody power coming in here they would call in hey three four seven sierra eight sierra romeo three miles to the north here inbound and they'll do a 45 come in and they'll do left hand pattern because us glider guys we're going to come over the high school and we're going to come in and do land right hand patterns gliders have the right away okay and i believe we've discussed right away so gliders have the right away um so if if we're both coming in landing at the same time you'd make a call and they would just happily do a nice little 360 out here and let you get in then they'd come in and land so everyone tries to play nice in the sandbox all right so what else let's just start with basic things right these these little circles these are airfields too but these are private airfields and they're probably grass strips i mean they are grass strips when they're not filled in I just here's a grass strip in stevenson and so when they're the solid circle they're paved runways okay all right there's our isogenic line which is uh our isogonic line which is showing our magnetic variation okay all right let's move on okay just to be totally complete i put this diagram back in here showing class g right so here we are class g we're we're between the ground and 1200 feet so we can go visibility and clear of clouds and we can do that all the way up until you fly up the side of mount hood and now you're above 10,000 feet and and you have to be and here you can still be and you have to change to the uh one prime rule okay and then i also put it again i put this i kind of like this one this was just a different way to to view things some people like to whoops some people like to view things a little bit differently and so here a guy is in class g he's below 1200 feet he's clear of clouds right and he's got one statute mile visibility and um now he goes above 1200 feet and he's got to be in the 152 rule right and then he goes above 10,000 feet and he's got to be in the one prime rule and he's got to have five statute miles of visibility okay so it just depends how you like to visually learn all right so classy here's our first general general controlled airspace okay so class e i like to think of it as all airspace 1200 feet and up to 17,999 right so all airspace above 1200 feet unless otherwise marked or federal airways we'll, we'll take a look at a federal airway so it's all this blue space up here is class e airspace pilot certification student certificate or better so all you guys um will be fine when you're all soaring on our ridge at uh you're all be in class e airspace entry requirements no entry requirements self announce no glider equipment none required no radio required no mode c transponder required okay um and and then our vfr weather minimum below 10,000. again it's the 152 rule a thousand feet above 500 feet below 2000 horizontal separation visibility three statute miles um same at night if we go above 10,000. it's the one prime rule a thousand feet above a thousand feet below 
one statute mile horizontal, visibility five statute miles. Okay, so let's see what that starts to look like on the map. Okay, so we move a little bit. Here's Hood River. Here's, here's Hood River, right? Now here's the Dalles. Now, so this space immediately above Hood River, it's class G, right? And then we get to, then we get 1,200 feet and above and we're class E. And that class E goes all the way up to 17,999 feet. But now we move over here to the Dalles and see this big magenta circle right here around the Dalles. Here's what we got right here. Class E airspace with floor 700 feet above surface that laterally abuts 1,200 feet or higher class E airspace. Now, in here, in this circle, class E airspace drops down to 700 feet. You come right over here, it's 1,200 feet. Come right here, starts 700 feet. That's because the Dalles has a couple approaches for airplanes. So that means, you know, right here, you can be, you know, 1,100 feet, clear of clouds, one statute mile. You pop over here at 1,100 feet, you gotta have three statute miles visibility. And that's to protect both of you as these planes are coming in, okay? So, so that, you know, that's a question that you probably will get asked about on your FAA written or not your written on your with your examiner because the ridge is right here, right? So when you're cruising on the ridge at a thousand feet, just a little bit over, and you you're in controlled airspace, right? So the examiners will start to get, just make sure you kind of know, especially everything in your sandbox. And we have a beautiful sandbox here to play with. Okay, so that's a little bit different class E. Let's go, let me show you another class, a little bit different what, now class E can go to the ground too. And here's where it went to the ground, right? So if we look in, I zoomed out here on Portland. So here's Portland. There's Portland and there's Troutdale, and we'll 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 move we'll work up to class Charlie. Don't worry. But I want to show you this box jetting out of Portland here. It's a it's a box like this 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 dotted magenta line. That means class E airspace comes from the ground up. Okay, so now this goes straight from the ground all the way to that seventeen thousand nine hundred ninety nine. So that all those rules those VFR minimum rules apply right from the ground through this box. And that's to protect a lot of different approaches coming in here to Portland. And they've got that crosswind runway right there. One. Okay. Charts are fun. All right. Another little view of class E. All this purple stuff is class E. So here we are below 10,000. We got the 152 rule and three mi mile, statute miles of visibility class and above 10,000 feet, one prime rule, 1,000 feet above, 1,000 feet below the cloud, one statute mile away from it, and five miles visibility up to there, okay? And then that other fun graph, this, this plane's in your, Class E airspace, he's 500 feet below it. He's 1,000 feet above the cloud. He's 2,000 feet horizontally away from it. He's got three statute miles, so he's legal. And then when he comes up here above 10,000 feet in Class E airspace, he's got to have our one prime rule and five statute miles. Okay, so just different ways to look at it. All right, Class Delta. Okay, here we go. So uh, here's our little class Delta airport, right? And so pilot certification, student certificate, you guys can fly in it. Glider equipment, radio, you should have a radio, okay? Um, 
and mode C transponder, nope. Entry requirements, radio contact. Um, you need to hear your end number, you must hear your end number. So if you call in and say, hey, Trotdale Airport, uh, Glider 24 Juliet, inbound for landing, and the Trotdale Airport says, uh, traffic to the uh, west, stand by, you didn't get your end number. You know, but if he says, "Ah, oh, two four Juliet, wow, glider, come on in," and uh, or you know, or he says, two four Juliet," um, you know, winds are light and variable, um, but you heard your call sign or your end number, you can come on in. He'll be shocked as heck as a glider coming in, so he'll then you'll have right away, so you'll be coming in anyway. Um, but must hear your end number, okay? Uh, weather minimums in class D, 152 rule, just like in class E, below 10,000, and visibility three statute miles. Now, most of your class D airports are a four nautical mile radius from the ground up to 2,500 AGL, okay? So that's generally their airspace. <laughs> The guys at the Troutdale Airport in the tower are awesome. Okay, so here's what Troutdale looks like. Um, over here, blue in, here's Troutdale. It partly sits under Portland or Class Charlie. Okay, so blue dotted line is Delta Airports or D airspace, and there's their airport, Portland Troutdale. We can see their tower frequency, 120.9. Here's their weather frequency, or their ATIS, 135.625. We can see it's 39 feet MSL, mean scene level. It's got a light. It's 5,400 feet long runway. And, <clears throat> okay. And 122.95. Okay, and if you blow in a little, this is the inset for Portland, so it's got a little bit more detail. And this number here, this two five zero, is the top of the is the top of the the class uh, Delta airspace. So, so from ground up to two five, it's Delta. Okay, so then. Above this, so at 2,600 feet, you could cruise over this without permission. And this starts Class Charlie airspace at 4,000 feet. The top of it's 4,000. The bottom of it's 1,700 feet. That's what these two numbers here. Here's the top of Class Charlie there. Skipping ahead a little bit there. All right. All right, ground up, Class Charlie. Here we go. So, Charlies, they start to look a little bit like uh, upside down wedding cakes, they like to call them, right? So you can see, so they they leap, try to leave air sport space under here for other smaller airports or what they don't need because as the big jets come in, they come in <laughs> like that. They don't need to come in. They don't come in way down here. So if they're not using the airspace, they let us have it, right? Okay, so pilot certificate, student certificate. You guys can fly in Class Charlie Airport. Uh, airspace, um, glider equipment, you would need a radio um, and uh, a mode C transponder. Okay, so what is a mode C transponder altimeter, right? So mode um, a mode C transponder allows you to, you know, they can call and give you a unique number so that they can track you around on their radar, four digit numbers. And they, they, um, let's say Ian calls in and he wants to land one of the 126s in, in, uh, Charlie airspace. And, uh, he gets, they actually give him permission to do that. And, um, or he 
So he would say, hey, this is 2-4 Juliet, and they'll and you, and actually, let's say he's going to thermal over Class Charlie airspace, which he would need permission to do that up to 10,000 feet. And they would be, hey, squawk uh, four, five, six, seven. And so Ian would write back, okay, four, five, six, seven, two, four, Juliet. And so as he's cruising around above class Charlie airspace at 6,000 feet, just circling, having fun in the thermals, he would just be blooping on his four, five, six, seven, be blipping on their radar. And a mode C would always be kind of telling them the pressure altimeter so they could verify that, yep, he's up there around 6,000 feet, and that's our glider just circling up there. Okay. So that's the two things that a mode C transponder does. You can, you can put in the unique code, and it gives uh, the uh, altimeter off of pressure at hundreds of feet, right? So it would either say like, 6,600 feet or 6,700 feet, okay. Um, weather minimums, again, 152 rules. You see that through, you know, all the way from class G up to class Charlie um, and visibility three statute miles. So if you're in, if they actually let you in the airspace, that's what you gotta have. The dimensions usually start about 5,000 and we'll go up to 10 nautical miles, okay? And it's usually 4,000 feet high, okay? Surface to 4,000 feet AGL. All right, so here's Portland area. Okay, so you can see, okay, so you can see Portland, and so there's your towered airport, right? And uh, no special VFR. So um, that's what that's what this means here. So if you see a no SF VFR, that means if you have less than you know, if you have that one mile visibility um, and less than uh, nor normal VFR minimums, right? So. Um, less than three statute miles miles of vis visibility, less than uh, a 3,000 foot ceiling, they won't let you, they don't want you in this airspace anyway, okay? And then here's Portland International. Um, here's its rate, here's its uh, tower frequencies, 118.7, 123.775. It depends which way you're coming in. Here's their ATIS field elevation. Uh, 31 feet. Here's the lighting. Um, you know. Uh, okay, so there's uh, there's Portland. You can go in a little bit closer. Again, there's that inset that I showed you from Troutdale, and then here is um, even just zoomed in a little bit closer, so you could see it. Now, looking at the circles here. So if you look at the inner circle. Um, this says surface to 4,000 feet, right? So there's surface to 4,000 feet. Now, if we look at the outer circles here, it's broken up into different chunks, right? This outer circle here is 1,700 feet to 4,000. So you can fly under that and be just fine. This one doesn't start till 2,300 feet. Um, you can see all of the tops are 4,000, right? This one starts at 1,800 feet. Now, here's Pearson Airfield is blocked out in there, and um, it starts at 1,100 feet, um, right? So, um, so that's your Class Charlie airspace. All right, Class Bravo, here we go. So pilot certification, uh, private certificate. So here now you'll, you'll have to be a private pilot to start going into Class Bravo airspace. There are some allow a student pilot with an instructor endorsement. It's just not something that we'll be really doing, but, um, but it, 
but there are some that allow it. Okay, the glider equipment uh, will need a radio and a mode C transponder. Um, uh, okay, so um, you can fly without it within the 30 nautical mile veil under 10,000 feet, um, as long as you're not actually meaning, and what they mean here is mean you can fly within any of these areas underneath it, as long as you're not going into the space, right? But if you do go above it, you will have to have it, the mode C transponder, okay? So the same with class C, you can, if you don't have permission, you can fly underneath these, right? All you want. Now with, with Bravo, you have to, you must hear, you are cleared into class Bravo. You, it's not, you, you need to hear your N number, like in class Charlie or class Delta. You have to hear, you are cleared into class Bravo to be able to enter class Bravo airspace, okay? And in class Bravo, there's no cloud requirement. It's clear of clouds and visibility. And why is that? That's because if you actually would get let into class Bravo, they steer you around the entire time. You're led around by the nose. Um, that's probably why another reason they're gonna keep a glider out unless you're a motor glider. Um, dimensions can be varied, uh, starting anywhere from generally five nautical miles at the base, and then they, they go way out from there, um, and they go up to 10,000 feet. And uh, here is Seattle, right? So Seattle, you can see that here's the widest from here. Sometimes you get, some of you can't see that. So from here, the blue line over to here and here is, so Seattle's more like this kind of a watch looking like if it was to extend out. I mean, here's the 30 nautical mile veil that you have to have a mode C transponder in unless you were certified without an electrical system, which most gliders are. So that's why you're allowed to fly in all that space as long as you don't actually enter into the class Bravo space. And um, so you can see like out here, this one starts at 6,000 goes, or six, yeah, 6,000 goes up to 10,000 feet, right? I zoomed in over on the left side here so we can get it, see a little bit more detail. There's Boeing Field, right? And so surface to 10,000, here's 3,000 to 10,000. They'll have these VFR corridors through class Bravo spaces for private pilots and VFR pilots that like, so here you can see two VFR corridors and you basically, as long as you're a thousand feet or above can just fly right over the airfield. And that's the best way because, you know, traffic is coming in here and here, but it's not coming here and here. So. They're happy, they're happy as a clam for you to just cruise on through there. It's kind of interesting. Okay, no commercials, I mean, questions, okay. All right, so Class Bravo, just, just last one, last look at this slide, Class Charlie, Class Delta, right? Uh, your Class Echo spaces, golf, Alpha, All right? Here's another look at that. And um, okay, class alpha, positive control airspace. So normally, all right, so what do you gotta have to go up there? You gotta have an instrument certificate, okay? Yeah, so your IFR pilots, are only going up here. However, unless you're one of us cool glider guys with a private certificate and an ATC wave window permission, <laughs> I think this is awesome because we can go busting on up in there in our gliders with our private certificate and some training, okay? So you will need a radio, right? And you will need a mode C transponder. Um, now, wave windows are given out um, all over 
uh, from different glider clubs. And I spent a, um, last week for fun looking around at different wave windows in the country and they vary in requirements. Um, so they do need, we do need to get our clearance. Um, and um, we'll take a look here a second at the Mount Hood wave window. Um, so now when you go into a wave window, so when you go above 18,000 feet, you no longer set from our Hood River altimeter, right? So whenever we go out flying, you should set your altimeter and once in a while check in with weather to reset in case pressure changes. But when you go up into class A, 18 alpha or 18,000 feet and above, you're required to set it to 29.92 inches of mercury right, per far 91, 121. Why is that? Well, if everyone up here sets their altimeter uh, to 29.92, well, then then you're all, you've all got the same reading no matter what the pressure's doing, okay? So that's the requirement there. Um, most of the wave window requirements as far as, because there's really no such thing as a VFR wave, weather minimum up here in class alpha but most of the what i've seen accepted from the atc centers that allow you to go up there is uh is things kind of like the one prime rule a thousand feet above thousand feet below uh one mile uh statute mile horizontally from clouds and five statute miles and they all require that you have positive visual of the ground um, and that you stay within the GPS coordinates. Um, let's take a look at so here is the Mount Hood area wave window. Um, this was set up uh this was a letter of an agreement between the willamette valley soaring club which uh, we're working on hood river getting uh, hooked into that and um, air traffic control um, so flight shall be conducted in uh, visual meteorological conditions uh, you got to remain clear of clouds maintain five statute miles flight visibility um, and uh, you need to call uh, the a the atc um an hour before on your way in right and so and they've given us this wave window from flight level eighteen thousand feet to flight level twenty five thousand feet now i was talking to rolf um from the willamette valley soaring club rolf um and he um said that he's asked ATC before he's like, oh, can I go higher? And he's, you know, they'll give him to 26 and they're like, can I go higher? And they've given him to 27. I think the highest he said he went was 27. But so here's Hood, Parkdale, Hood River would be up here. And so here's your coordinates. So you'd put those in your GPS coordinates or take this, a copy of this map with you and stay in there the best you can. Um, pretty cool. Let's see, any questions on that? I don't see any questions. Okay. Oh, there is a question. So we'd need a GPS to stay in the wave window. Technically, Eric, probably so. Um, unless, yeah, tech, technically that would be the best way. I mean, uh, you could eyeball it, I'm sure. Um, but uh, are there public charts with this info? No, no. When the wind wave window is active, a, anybody coming through that area, ATC would actually route around this, right? So um, they they would they would, uh, and most of the flying, most of the most of the airline traffic is coming th right here or about 12,000 feet right through here so but uh if if you made this active they would route everybody around this 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 basically 
you own that until you go out? Great questions. I wish that would let me choose that. All right. So here's the questions, right? When a control tower, oh, okay, I didn't talk about this. I meant to talk about this. We will now. When a control tower located on an airport within Class D air space ceases operation for the day, what happens to the airspace designation? Okay, so this kind of actually happens with Troutdale. Uh, A, the airspace designation normally will not change. The airspace remains class D airspace as long as a weather observer or automated weather system is available. Or C, the airspace reverts to class E or a combination of class E and G airspace during the hours the tower is not in operation. All right, so this is the answer C. Now, by definition, class D airspace surrounds airports that have an operational control tower. So class D airspace reverts to class E airspace if the weather observer is present or the weather system is automated. So if it's not, then it goes to class G, right? So this happens to Troutdale. So Troutdale at night when its control tower shuts down um, at 10 p.m., it becomes class E airspace because they have an automated weather system, right? Now, if their weather system takes a dump and it stops, then it becomes a class G airspace, okay? So um, just a little tidbit fact. I wanted to put that in there because the rest of the stuff was straightforward. Okay. And then you get a lot of these questions on the written. The airspace overline Collin County Regional McKinney is controlled from the surface too. So they told us to look at Area, area 7, Collin County controlled. All right. So the airspace overline Collin County is controlled from the surface too. So what they're asking here for, where'd my little, is the 2 9 there. Um, Everybody see that the two nine there, so to 2,900 feet MSL. And we got a question. How many questions is on the written? Great question, Logan. I believe for glider pilots, it's 60. I think it's 60 questions and you have like two and a half hours to answer them. Um, okay. All right. And there we go, 2,900 feet. All right, so special use airspace, I'll kind of blow through this a little bit. Um, so there's several different special use airspaces out there, and most of these are kind of like military spaces that um, some of them you absolutely have to stay out of them, um, which would be detrimental to your health, or um, and some of them are just used during certain times, okay? So starting with this first one, prohibited areas, established for security or other reasons associated with the national welfare. Um, the only prohibited area we have is up in the Puget Sound here at the Bangor uh, P51. So I, I believe this is a nuclear sub area. And um, when you look at the chart explanations on the side of your chart, um, it'll tell you that this is from uh, to from the surface to 2,500. So you can fly over this area, you know, if you're 3,000 feet um, or above, but um, you start getting too close and uh, you're going to meet the F-15s. Um, okay, so restricted area. Here's out in Boardman, just to the east of us, right? Unusual, often invisible hazards to aircraft, such as artillery firing, <laughs> aerial gunnery, or guided missiles. Aircraft may enter, may enter unless permission has, aircraft, I think this is supposed to say, may not enter unless permission has been obtained from the controlling agency, okay? So there's a lot of different little air spaces here because some of this you could actually kind of cruise through, right? But all this here restricted to flight level 20,000 feet, this portion here is restricted to flight level 6,000, right? Best just avoid all this. Just if you come over here, just kind of 
go down around this way, right? Okay. Gun, you know, artillery firing, it's kind of hazardous to gliders. Warning area. Um, so here we're looking out on the west coast. Here's Astoria, Astoria, Oregon. And um, so here's a warning area here. These consist of airspace that may contain hazards to non-participating aircraft in international airspace. So this is kind of similar to restricted. You won't really head out here. And um, interesting enough, this is usually from like 1,000 feet to 60,000 feet. So I guess you could fly underneath it. But of course, you are going out past the the eight is here, which is the international line. Um, okay, military operations areas. Um, whoop. Here's, uh, here's, oh, so here's the Dows. Let me pop on there. Here's the Dows. Here's Hood River. Here's Mount Hood. And here's a big, big old one close to us. There's several of them close to us now. These consist of airspace established to separate military training aircraft from IFR traffic. So there's no restriction against a, a pilot operating VFR in these areas. However, be alert since training activities may include acrobatic and abrupt maneuvers. Now this Red Hawk MOA, I think it actually starts around 17 or 18,000 feet and goes up. So you fly under this stuff often. And um, and so, um, there, you know, there's some of these up over um, on the way to Yakima. One time I was flying back from Yakima and I saw a F-15 uh, at my 12. I could have probably taken him out, but, um, found, you know, we're on the same side and I was only in a 172. So anyway, um, that's what MOAs are. Um, we fly through them a lot. Um, but uh, um, if they would ever be like super full of activity um, and you're on with ATC, they usually tell you. Let's see here. All right, so alert area. Um, um, I couldn't find an alert area near us, um, but uh, I was curious, so I went out and found one, and uh, this is down near Pensacola. And so alert area is just high volume of pilot training or unusual aerial activity taking place. Um, so you can see all this out here, they have an alert area, and it's totally fine for you to fly through. And I'm sure if you were in that area, you'd kind of have a feeling for what operations were. Um, now, something we will see a lot here is uh, temporary flight restrictions um, or TFRs due to fire or search and rescue. A NOTAM will be issued, um, and you can see that on Sky Vector. Um, we would post those around the airport, um, and uh, you can always, it's obviously, it's always best to, um, before you go fly, um, you should always look for NOTAMs. Uh, you can look at the pilot web. Um, you can Google this pilot web. It should be in your slide deck there and put uh, your state or route of traffic in. Um, uh, and, put, and so here I pulled it up. Um, last special use area is um, special con uh, consideration areas. Uh, Wanted to point this out because we have one here um, south of us. So here we are, Hood River. Here's Mount Hood. And um, these are areas where pilots are requested to maintain a minimum altitude of uh, 2,000 feet um, above, uh, AGL above. So different wilderness areas. Um, Right here is one that they prefer. We stay 2,000 feet above. Um, and uh, when this is over water, this is, um, it's not uh, recommend, it's not requested, it's uh, mandatory. Um, okay, so. Um,
Okay, so flight through a restricted area should not be accomplished unless the pilot has filed an IFR plan, received prior authorization from the controlling agency, received prior permission from the commanding officer of the nearest military base, and this one will be B from the controlling agency. Okay. All right. So that concludes uh, airspace. Um, any questions or anything like that, please feel free to email me, call me, text me. Um, and let's move on to uh, navigation, flight preparation, and planning. Um, okay. So going somewhere, right? Um, glider flying, but beyond our immediate area requires uh, a significant amount of preparation. Um, you Really, when you get to this point of cross-country flying, there's going to be, you're going to have done a lot of little tasks and, um, and have gotten comfortable with reading um, different uh, spots of where you think lifts are going to come from and things like that and you know if this was if you if we were talking private pilot here uh as far as power um you know we'd be talking strictly about like going somewhere by flying by the reference to ground uh landmarks um we'd be using our dead reckoning skills which is where you do navigation in which the magnetic heading is predetermined um, considering true course, wind, magnetic variation, deviation, airspeed, and time. And so you would mark a course like here to here. And, you know, this, this is so uh, almost 20 miles and it should take you amount, this amount of time. And, and then, and the course would go on and on, right. For, uh, power pilots. Um, and, uh, and you could figure out, you know what the winds are doing if you get there by time what you're expected but it's it's not that doesn't work for us because for us to go from here to the dows like you know the tow plane's going to drop us off here and we're going to have to you know climb and circle and get some lift and then maybe you know try to come over here of oh but we lose too much and we come back and we you know thermal some more and maybe hook into the wave and come down here or we make our way over here to um, seven hills and uh, then we got to climb some more before we try to get over uh, seven hills to get there. I mean, so we're going to be using thermals, ridge lift, uh, wave to get to places. Um, and it's something our club is very young at doing and i um, hoping this year we're going to see a lot more people doing it including you guys um, so we're going to talk about um, different ways to do cross-country plans um, for glider pilots so what you will use right is we we really start thinking in this term of the this safe glide zone and um, and here's an airport and we want to the further we get out we or a landing area maybe it might not be an airport it might be a, a, a landing area that you feel comfortable in and us coming to get you with the trailer right so you're always going to be trying to stay with in these areas that you could put down in a safe place if you had to so we're going to be using glide slope management we'll talk about that um, our current chart Right, we talked about the current chart. Um, we'll be working with flight uh, flight profile, so go ahead points uh, and concentric circles. Um, safety factor. Um, we'll be starting everybody out around here with a 50% glide ratio. So what we said our glider was 23 to one. Uh, that's when it was brand new. Um, so we'll really bring you down to 20 to one. So we're going to be starting out with a 10 to one glide ratio, um, which is not great, right? Um, but this accounts for your unexpected sink. This accounts for the glider performance performing less than you expect it to. This counts for uh, builds a safety factor in for you performing less. 
uh, wink, wink, than you expect to. Um, as you start to gain more experience, we'll, you know, we'll put 75% back in there. Um, so what are, how, how do we build safe glide zones? Um, right, so that means staying within a suitable landing area plus a thousand feet for your pattern, right? So we're always going to have that thousand feet for our for our pattern uh, or more. We can we can always give ourselves some extra insurance. Say I want to get to a place and always have fifteen hundred feet or two thousand feet at the very most. Let's say, right? So um, a few different ways to do some glide slope management. Um, Immediately uh, in the plane, um, we can just, we'll start to develop minimums uh, based on experience during training. So our first few trainings, we're going to go up and, and do to 3,000 feet, and we're going to be with an easily glide, uh, easily, easy gliding distance from the field. A lot of times we're going to be right above the field, just doing our pattern work while everyone else is taking off and landing right underneath us, right? And um, and uh, so it's it'll be simple to do some quick in the math, quick in the head math using post-it notes and knee boards and things. Um, you can make a glide slope ruler, um, which will basically show you how much altitude to cover a given distance that you can use on your chart. Um, got a process for you to do that for free. Um, safe glide circles, this is going to be more what I'll be kind of pushing you toward. Um, of course, some of the pilots have flight computers, uh, and that can be either in the glider or portable, and you'll eventually probably get into these yourself. Um, you know, with our cell phones, uh, it's, it's really burnt the cost down for some of that stuff. But we'll be starting out and the examiner expects you to be doing this where, you know, the computer always fails. So you got to know how to do it anyway, right, for the exam. All right. So safe glide zones. Here's just kind of the quick in the math or quick in the head math that I was kind of talking about. Um, okay. So at a 10 to 1 glide ratio, right, for let's say the, our training glider you'll be in, big orange. Um, for every one statute mile, we're going to burn 500 feet, right? So if we use 10 to 1, that's going to be, that's, that's our, we're being, uh, that's our safety zone here. So 10 to 1, right? So if our goal is for Sierra 2, okay, and traffic pattern altitude is 1,500 feet, and the IP or the entry point, which is the high school, I've got that down here at the red mark, right? My black mark here is we're gonna let's say we go up and decide that I'm gonna start teaching you how to do some soaring on the ridge, right? And then where this black mark is is the notch, right? And so at the notch on the ridge is three miles from here to the high school. So we're going to add 1,500 feet to our 1,600 feet. We need to be here, right? So 3,100 feet. We get off toe at 3,600 feet. So that gives us 500 feet to play on the ridge, right? And if we, if we find some lift, well, then we can just play around and we'll start learning some ridge techniques and maybe do some maneuvers that you'll have to do for the check ride, like your, your steep turns and your slow flight and things. And we can play up there as long as we find lift. But our stop point when we're new is 3,100 feet, right? And at 31, and the, the, the very opening of the ridge here, you'll learn it well. That's kind of, I always think it as my leave point if I get down to, I get down to 3,100, no more lift, or it just wasn't a day of lift, or it moved on, or the conditions changed, and I'm heading back, right? And according to this, using our safety pattern, 
no wind day, right, at 50 miles per hour, I'm going to get here, probably be above 1,600 feet. But if we if we have to do, if we do have some headwind, remember, we'll add one half to one times the headwind to get over here. So if we have 20 knots of headwind, we could speed up to 60 and get over here. Or if we have a little bit of sink through there, remember, rule of thumb, so for speed to fly, right? Add five miles per hour for every knot of sink on the variometer. So if we got, say, two knots of sink, then we'll, we'll, we're back up to 60 anyway cruising over there. Of course, we don't want to exceed our VA, right? And then headwind, um, well, we just discussed that. If you've got a tailwind, you can decrease 10%. Uh, so go kick down to 48. Enjoy that over there. Remember, don't fly less than minimum sink. And if you got lift on the way, we'll fly minimum sink through it, right? And uh, Or a thermal or a cloud street. Let's say you got a cloud street going way to the other side of the valley. Take it. Go over there. Have some fun with it, right? So this is just, again, just starting off with some, this is quick in the math head. And this is just playing right around the airfield. You're going to always be comfortable. You know, like, it, three mile radius around the airfield, anything above 3,100 feet. I'm over the river, I'm over town, I'm good. I'm down here south of the field, I'm good, right? So in this big circle here, three miles away from the high school or the um, initial point, if I'm above 3,100 feet, I can make the airfield. So anywhere in here, right, you know, and crawl up to 4,000, you know, you can go out to four or five miles, right? So 500 feet per mile, right? On top of your 1,600 feet. Okay, so that's, that's where we're gonna kind of be starting out through our training and, and thinking about it. So, oh, interesting little circle here. I guess that, oh, that's my, that's my three mile radius. I could go other places here, right? Um, so I, I drew my circle on my map. So there's my three miles. I can play, I could go up here above the river, over the bridge. You know, I can go down along the, ri the ridge, okay? The one place I won't go is behind the ridge. Remember when we talked about ridge soaring, all the lift, is up in front or maybe on top, but usually a little bit more up in front of the ridge. If we go over, that's where all the sink is. That's where as, uh, as students and new pilots, we're not gonna be going, okay. Okay, now there's the glide slope ruler, how much altitude to cover over a given distance, right? So you start venturing out a little further here I've got the link for you. You can go there and download this for free from gliderbooks.com and this handy ruler allows you to just put okay how far am I and what altitude do I want to be. So in this example here um, this pilot is uh, so his field elevation is 3076 feet he wants to be at this field at 4,000 feet, right? And he's, um, and so he puts this down here and he sees that he's, he, he wants to be 4,000 feet. So this thing tells him he needs to climb up to 12,000 feet to glide this distance, which looks like 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 miles, right? So, and then you can see over here that it also builds in for headwind. So then you would move up further on the headwind. Um, calculates his headwind as well. I have that right there. So um, this is great. You got to be organized in the cockpit, um, especially great for two people teams, crew resource management. You can have one pilot flying and the other one kind of, uh, navigating, right? So 
starts to get social and fun. You can do, obviously you can do this by yourself. You could have a little knee board or whatnot. Um, but uh, go to gliderbooks.com. You can download that for free and it'll show you how to make it. Uh, okay, next thing is um, safe glide circles. And we're gonna spend a lot of time here. Um, so here we go, safe glide circles. Um, so you got to know your glide ratio. So you got to know the performance of your plane and you're going to create safe concentric altitude circles, right? So, um, these circles here, uh, what they've drawn, this is four miles out. This is six, this is eight, right? This is 10 miles out. And, uh, even in the little cartoon here, 9,000 feet to Dakota or 12,000 feet to Cody, right? And you could write in here the altitude of what you need to be for the performance of your glider um, or use the chart. So then that way, if you do that, um, if you know you got to be 5,000 feet out here, you could go either way. Now, the one thing when you start drawing uh, circles on your chart and i'll show you that here in a second you do got to be especially in our area conscientious about terrain don't get blind to the oh i only need to be uh eight thousand feet here but there's a 9600 foot peak in the way right so um okay now i don't know did anybody and you could write in your text book did anybody watch the webinar last night with um with uh, cindy uh, breckner i think her was her name um she went over uh this very similar thing and she kind of looked at it more as easy as um quick math right so those simple questions of how do you know will you make it to your to the home airport? Could you make it to the next landable airfield? Right? Will you make it to the next landable location? Okay. And, and I I literally stole all these slides from her, and she said that we could on the webinar. And uh, but I thought it was so timely since we were going to be going over this, and she did a nice job with it. So she said to answer all those questions, you got to know your distance from the objective. Yep. Okay. So that means we got to carry some type of chart, right? You must know your machine's glide performance. Okay. We've done that. And you must know your, your performance safety margin. Okay. So we've tied that in. We we're given ourselves 500 feet per mile as our sink rate. And using her slides again here, she took a Schweitzer model um 20 to 1 and uh so at 20 to 1 that would be 264 feet or 300 foot per mile loss we're going with 500 in in her example here see she says knowing safety margins bronze badge program they say cut the performance by 50. now she went in to say you know, we just looked back two slides back. We said that our plane at 20 to 1 would be 300. They're saying 50. She kind of met them in the middle and went for 400, right? Because if we were adding, oops, at a, at a headwind for best L over D, right she was saying so if we had a 10 knot headwind she'd say we'd have 20 percent less worse performance um and now she i like this she had this rule of if you're coming home you're always gonna have 1500 feet you're going to always make sure you come back to 1500 feet around your airfield. And if you're going to an away field that you always have 2000 feet. Okay. 
and you'll see here what she was doing. I like this. Um, so in her examples, she uh, she allowed the Schweitzer um, to only cost you 400 feet a mile instead of 500 feet a mile. Okay, so, and just sticking with her slides again here, the objective is simplicity, right? So we will sum the field elevation and arrival into one number, okay? Tailwind, just disregard it. So the performance is only for um, headwind. And so, So, and here's her math, distance time performance with the wind adjustment plus arrival, right? So, required altimeter reading to go. This is the basic formula up on top here. Um, and so here's what you can do. You can do chart preparation and she suggests using five mile and 10 mile circles around your home, okay? So here's what she did. And here's what I'd recommend as well. <clears throat> okay, so here is Bermuda High Field, okay? So, and all the orange circles around here are five mile radius. Okay, now this is a area of the country that is much more flat of ours, right? And if you take a general landscape, view of the landscape, 605, between these two, 605, 776. So the ground is, you know, hovers between six and 700 feet, right? And then the yellow circles are 10 mile radiuses, okay? And, um, so if this was your home field and you launched off and any time you want to come back, right, um, then you want to be 1,500 feet, right? So plus the field elevation, 600, uh, so 2,100 feet, right? And so the way she says you like make the math easy, right? Is you're needing 400 feet per the glider, right? So if you're out here four miles out, well, four times four, you need 1600 feet to be out here and right, and plus the 2100. So 3700, four miles out, anywhere in here, 3700 and in, and you're golden. Right, and she even takes it a step further, which I would recommend anybody to do, and and go ahead and write those numbers in. So she wrote it down here, 3,500 feet. So if you're anywhere in the circle, five miles, five mile radius circle, you're at 3,500 feet, then you could make it into there, right? And if you come here. Now, what she has here, 1,500 feet for arrival home and 2,000 feet arrival elsewhere, right? So this, since you took off here, and this is not your home airport, she's saying, make sure you come in here with 2,000 feet so you can check it out and get yourself set up and be comfortable. That's probably a great idea as a beginner. And then as you get more comfortable, you can lower that down to, say, the pattern altitude. Okay. Um, anybody having some questions they want to ask about this, feel free to take the time out. And so as you're writing that out or, you know, I can kind of everyone quiz themselves at home, right? Let's say you want to come in here at 1,600 feet, right? They want you to be here. And so out here, four, t four times five is 2,000. So 
that's 3,600 feet or 35. She wrote 35. I guess she's rounded down a little bit, you know. Now you want to venture out here, you know, so you're seven miles out, seven times four. You need 2,800 feet on top of your 1,600 feet. So 28, would I say 28 plus 16, right? So um, 4,200 feet out here. Seven mile radius, you know, anywhere out here, you know, you can get back in here. Um, and so that's the whole point of uh, that's a, as far as you're just. That's kind of cross country soaring, if you will, made simple as far as like, well, I'm here. Uh, I know I can get back here. Uh, I know I can go here. That's only seven miles away, too, right? So um, I just think it's a super cool way to to look at kind of flying around. Um, now I did a diff. So uh, so here's a profile view my safe glide profile plan, right? So here's what you would think of as a profile view, even though in the glider world, this is really what we consider a profile as far as uh, soaring a plan, okay? For beginning cross country pilots. Now, I made a point, I, here's a different thing that, I want to do sometime is I want to go from Hood River to the Dalles and and so I've calculated some points here my start point would be the the ridge here's my first X right and my second area that I would like to I think try to make it to is there's a forest service field here at Mosier and then I know the, and then I'd like to get over here to the end of Seven Mile, which has a lot of flat spaces. And I'm pretty sure if I can get here, then I know I've got the dowels made, right? And so these are my go point. These are my go ahead points, right? And so using, I went ahead and used 50% of the glide ratio, the 10 to one. So it's going to cost me 500 feet per mile. And that's, that's, that safety margin is calculating in downdrafts and headwind and things like that, right? So the Rid de Mosier service field is seven from here to here, seven statute miles. Okay. Now, hopefully it's a day I could just get super high and maybe even jump into the some wave and just get down there. But if it's not, I've calculated um, with with leaving me a thousand I, I added a thousand feet here. I need four thousand six hundred and ninety six feet to leave the ridge and make it here. Okay. And I'll show you some circles here soon. And well, I'll just go there. I'll show you my plan. Okay. So wind most of the time comes from the northwest right and if i get up to 4696 feet i've got all this area easy okay and the problem we have here with going back and forth like on that flat land is well our land's not flat so um when i when I get this elevation here, I'm going to make my way over to the Mosier field. And when I get to Mosier, it's a forest service field. My next goal is here. So Morris, the, the service field to the end of seven mile is six statute miles from there to there. Okay. And I'm going to need, uh, 4,168 feet to, to be sure to get here and have a thousand foot clearance or choose a place over here to land, okay? And so when I get here, 
if I've if I got 2,800 feet, 2,848, or or that I can build up to that, I'm good to go uh, to to land in the Dalles. And all this is going to happen through thermaline ridge wave. This kind of would be a bit of a short flight for wave, um, maybe not, but. Um, so this is this would be like a plan that you may propose um, to an examiner to get uh, to do a cross country, um, and I'll help you build that. And the, obviously, the other way would be to do this, right, as well. And this would be acceptable. But you probably really the idea is to try to go from one place to to another place. That one there allows you to go kind of anywhere, which is not a bad idea either. So I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on here. These are the techniques that um, you're going to be learning out in the in the field this summer with us. Um, so thermaling, um, do you want to just give some basic rules here to start thinking about? And you're going to read this in the book um, for therming, thermaling. Uh, you always turn in the same direction if there's another glider in the thermal before you, right? And you're going to want to always try to position yourself to see that pilot. Um, on the SSA website, there is a super great uh, webinar. It's recorded uh, called Thermaline 101, the easy as one, two, three method of thermaline, right? And the whole idea here, you can see this. This pilot came, his left wing got ticked up, and he made a 270 to make a circle to go back into it, because otherwise he would maybe lose it or miss it. But this um, webinar is very good, um, definitely worth the time. There's a lot of good webinars on there, but uh, just pointing this one out on ther thermaline. Okay, so same direction. That can be a test question. Ridge soaring. Um, the ridge rules are that turns are made into the wind, meaning away from the ridge. So if you're on the ridge and you're going to make a turn, turn away from the ridge. Um, if you're passing between you and another glider, make sure you go between the glider and the ridge because they should be technically turning away from the ridge, right? And you would be passing between them and the ridge so they won't turn into you. Um, Flying directly over or under another glider is prohibited. Um, if there's a good amount of space, that's okay, but not right uh, under because they could suddenly turn and tip a wing and you guys bump into each other. And, you know, sometimes we do have five or six gliders up there together, and which is a lot of fun, but just keep uh, safe distance and keep your eyes out. Um, um, if you are going cross country and you must approach a ridge from the downwind side, make sure you do it with an excess amount of altitude um, and it should be done at an angle. So if this word facilitate was the ridge and you were coming at the ridge from the, de the back side, meaning the wind's coming over here and you're coming here, you don't want to go straight. You want to go at it an angle so that if it comes down so fast, you could turn away and dive away and have altitude. See what I'm saying? So you'd want to try to cross it at a 45 degree angle, right? Always cross ridges at a 45 degree angle so you can always turn away from them. Okay. That's for your own safety. Um, and then wave soaring, it's going to be sma fast, smooth wind with strong lift and sinks and turbulence in the rotor. So you have to watch for those rotor clouds. Carry O2 warm clothes and uh, be alert for uh, adverse weather that uh, could prevent you from getting to your airport. So some just, just key simple things there. Um, you're going to read more about this and we'll discuss it more this summer. Um, okay few more things here. So another part of cross-country flying would be landing out, right? So, um, or off-field landing. Um, if you're going to do that, recognize and accept the situation, okay? So what's that mean? Calm, cool, collected, fly the glider. You, some of you may have heard the phrase, uh, aviate, navigate, communicate. Um, always just 
fly the plane you're in. Um, um, and you're going to have already practiced spot landings with me several times. So if you have to land off field, you're going to be comfortable in choosing a good field and, and landing as short as you possibly can. So you, one, don't hurt yourself and we can rebuild gliders. So don't worry about that. OK, but we want to make sure you're safe or your passenger as well. Um, so decision altitudes conservatively, um, 3,000 feet, you should start to form a plan. If you're getting around 3,000 feet, um, it's time to start selecting a, a general field landing area. Um, now, obviously, you find lift, go for it. Um, go get back up there. Um, but you're going to start looking for clues on wind speed and direction. I like to use the wind wire surface slope. Right, and um, this is from a good book that's a free download from Kai Gersten called Off Airport Landings. After you solo, I'll have you read this. But wind wires, surface slope, we wanna know where that wind's coming from so that if we are gonna land, we, we wanna try to land into it. Um, we obviously don't wanna land into wires. You gotta look for um, either fence post or uh, uh, telephone lines because wires are hard to see, right? surface we want to try to find the flattest surface um, freshly plowed surface might be nice um, and slope it's always a little bit of a debate but i think it's better to try to land uphill downwind than it is to land downwind or downhill i mean right so um take an up slope two thousand feet we're going to start to select, select more of the specific specific field. Um, again, looking for hazards and obstacles. Um, and at this point, you know, first choice could turn out to be a bad idea as we get a little closer, right? So we may need a quick second choice. If you still you find lift, get out of there. Looking for clues on wind speed direction, right? Or the wind wire surface slope. Thousand feet, we're committing. You find lift, no, nope, you're landing. Okay, at this stage of the game, you're landing. Um, uh, fly your normal pattern per angles, not landmarks. And um, so this will mean a little bit more to people that have some flying experience. You really try to fly your pattern and your landing position by um, the way your angles look to you and not by a landmark well i always turn at wham and i always do this and i always do that because wham's not always going to be there and and uh you know john benton's house isn't always going to be there right um and then you call your retrieval team and you wait and uh, make friends with the farmers that you, the field you landed in right um getting towards the end here. So cross-country prep, right? You're gonna need to personal items, sunscreen, towel, urine disp disposal system, O2 system, cell phone, survival kit, tie-down kit, your navigation items, your glide roller, or your portable flight computer, or your new uh, glide zone circles there. Um, you've already practiced your spot landings. Um, you know, when we're practicing spot landings, we'll cover that altimeter that gives you a feeling of being at a different airfield because um, your altimeter don't, doesn't mean a whole hill of beans at that point anyway. Then um, your retrieve team assembled and communication worked out. You might have a spot on you or something like that. Um, you'll have been hydrated before you left and you'll have some water and food with you and a little bit of cover until uh, we get there to get you. Okay, here's one of the questions. What is the proper airspeed to use when flying between thermals on a cross-country flight against a headwind? Uh, a, best lift drag speed increased by one half the estimated uh, wind velocity. Um, it's looking good. B, minimum sink. Uh, increased by one half and see the best lift drag speed decreased by one half. All right, so that's A, best lift drag speed increased by one half, the estimated wind velocity, right? Okay, so um, 
there will be a few questions about this on the FAA written. Um, I don't know if exam. Uh, I don't know if Mike likes to ask any questions about this or not, but uh, here we are. So this is the looking at accidents or incidences, right? So CFR 49 part uh, 830 um, subpart, and I just want to bring your attention to it, um, notification and reporting of aircraft accidents, right? So the subpart A is mostly definitions. Um, interesting to know aircraft accident. Uh, means an occurrence associated with the operation of an aircraft, which takes place between the time any person boards the aircraft with the intention of flight, and all such persons have disembarked. So um, someone could be moving an airplane uh, from a hangar to another hangar and have uh, create some substantial damage, I don't know, gets away and hits another hangar or something, but there was no intention of flight, and so it's not an aircraft accident. Um, it'll probably just be a claim with the insurance, right? Um, fatal insur or injury here means an injury which results in death within 30 days, so if you die 31 days after the accident, was it, does that, was that part of the aircraft accident? I don't know, but, um, Skipping down to serious injury, injury, some examples of it means an injury which requires hospitalization for more than 48 hours, commencing within seven days from the date of injury was received. You can read the rest of those, um, substan substantial damage, right? I just pulled a few of the interesting ones out. Subpart B, um, this is, uh, talks about when you have to immediately notify, right? So the operator of a civil aircraft shall immediately, and by the most expeditious means available, notify the nearest NTSB when an aircraft accident or any of the following listed serious incidences occur, a flight control system malfunction or fa failure, all right? Inability to, of a required a flight crew member to perform normal flight duties as a result of injury or illness in flight fire not likely for us unless it's oxygen um, aircraft collision in flight uh, right um, so I took out a few of the ones that would not really pertain to us um, part C preservation um, there could be questions about this on the written. Can you move it? Yes, you can move it to remove persons or injured if they're trapped to protect the wreckage from further damage or to protect from uh, public injury, right? Um, and then the last part, this is the most important one. This is the one you'll get your questions on. Um, operator of a civil, public, or foreign aircraft shall file a report on this form, board form 6120, within 10 days after an accident or after seven days, if an overdue aircraft is still missing, um, a report on an incident for which immediate notification is required by 830.5 shall be filed only as requested by authorized, right? So only if you get requested. So the questions are, the operator of an aircraft that has been involved in an accident is required to file an NTSB accident report within how many days? Five, seven, or 10. So there's your 10, okay. And then the operator of an aircraft has been involved in an incident is required to submit a report to the nearest field office of the NTSB within seven days, within 10 days when requested, and that's only when requested. Okay. Um, most mid-air collision accidents occur during A, hazy days, B, clear days, C, cloudy days. And that's B, clear days. So make sure when we're out there that you're just uh, always kind of just scanning. You, you'll come up with a scan pattern left to right, right to left. Um, we haven't had any issues with it yet, and we hope not to. All right, so we are at the end of the glider ground portion. This is what we covered, 
everything in red, everything in black, we're going to be doing out on the airfield this year, um, which is a lot of the fun stuff. So um, pre-flight procedures, airport and glider operations. Um, so some of this stuff you'll feel keep reading in your books because these are some of the questions that you can get, right? Sign F confirms your position on. So let's find sign F 22. So that is, I believe, A, runway 22, right? So this is kind of some rote memory stuff. So I left that for you to do at home, learn their runway signs. Um, if your glider is equipped with a 4096 code radar beacon transponder, which we were talking about earlier, the code utilized for normal operations is, and 1202 is a, for glider, 1200 is normal VFR for all power guys, and 1202 is VFR for, um, for us. And so um, communication, read, You'll have some questions about this, and we'll and uh, we'll talk a lot about this out on the field. Um, but you'll start uh, learning about this in your question banks to, to, for the test. The correct method of stating 10,500 feet MSL to ACT is 10,500 feet, 10.5, 1,000,500. That's going to be C. And I think they still require glider pilots to know ATC light gun signals in case you decide to come in and your radio stopped working. An alternate red and green light signal directed from the control tower to an aircraft and a flight signal is to hold position, exercise extreme caution, not land. It's going to be B for you, right? So exercise extreme caution and that's just for the written again all right just a reminder for those of you uh, youth members um, we have a work study program where we'll pay you 15 bucks towards your training um, for every hour you work for the club hauling gliders launching gliders working on a cool project like websites or making videos or helping us set up tasks um, so how that works is basically you just fill out a, an application and you can start building those credits right away. They can't be applied to your, I don't know if the club calls it your bill or whatnot, until after you pass the pre-written solo exam. And to get to the pre-solo written exam, you've got to start doing some flying and, um, and then once an instructor realizes you're really close to your solo, meaning that you get to actually go up and fly around by yourself, um, they will have you take that solo exam, which would just basically review um, a lot of the performance aspects of the plane, which we've learned in here, and and then all the uh, the culture and operations of out at the airport. So you'll learn that out on the airfield. Um, and then at that point, you can start applying your credit, your work study credits. But I um, encourage you all, if you're not taking advantage of that, to sign up for that. Um, and that's it. Um, we made it through. And uh, so I hope you guys have learned something. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, hopefully I'll see you on Sunday at the um, spring safety refresher. All right, good job, guys. Take care.